Yep. Give me a nod you when you're ready. Like four, four, Shooter's four. ready. Stand by. Hey everyone, it's Matt Gunlock from Bullets and Bourbon. I'm joined here with my co-host Frank Gow, and I have a very special guest, Kelsey Mead. Now, Kelsey and I, we met a few years ago um, whenever I got this harebrained idea to bring the team over to the strength strength and conditioning trainers over at Quantico on Mainside out at the Hit Center. And I was like, hey, I want to blend movements that we see in competition and I want you to kind of start training us toward those movements, the explosiveness, the strength, and just start getting us in shape. And, you know, in that first season, uh, I, I saw a lot of benefit, you know, I saw a lot more flexibility, a lot of the stretching that we did and the, a lot of the one-on-one -on -one training that we got, I would say was extremely beneficial to the preparation that we encountered that season. And a lot of it came down to Kelsey just helping us build that program up. And the team has kind of continued that legacy of uh of continuing to go and get the training that they need. So before yeah. I go any further, Kelsey, can you kind of introduce yourself and give us a background? Sure. Uh so I've been at Quantico for almost four years. Um, I got there in January 2020, uh, and before that, I was with the Navy for three and a half years as a strength coach, and before that, I was with uh, the Marine Corps again, but at Cherry Point. Um, so I've been doing the tactical side of strength conditioning for a long time, but I've actually been in the Division I like, athletic setting for even longer. Um, I've been a strength coach since roughly about 2010. And I went and graduated and then worked for a little bit at uh, the University of New Hampshire as a strength coach before going and getting my master's degree at Boston University, which was really cool. So I've worked with a lot of really great teams and a lot of really great athletes, um, but I wanted something different. And the military just seemed to really fit like it was really what I was looking for. And it's been fantastic. Um, I've absolutely loved being with the Marine Corps, and I think there's a lot of um, a lot of really good connections that have come from the collegiate side with the tactical military side. Very cool. I got to ask, are you from the Northeast? I am. Yes, I. Well, I wasn't born there. Um, my dad was actually in the Air Force, so. I was born in California, moved all over the place, but mostly in the Northeast because my dad flew B-52. So we were in Maine and um, like Loring up near Canada. So spent most of my life in New England. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I met my wife going to Emerson College. Uh, okay. So I'm also a California kid, ended up going to school in Boston. Uh, yep. And then my first duty station was out in Fort Devens, which is like Iyer, Massachusetts. Yeah. So I, I used to go there for my drills over the weekend. So uh small world um yeah i yeah. i still love new england boston's one of my favorite places yeah i just a video just popped up on my youtube feed about how the mbta is like the most dangerous subway system in the united oh states God. uh so good times we're, we're that, not here that, that doesn't surprise me no we're not here to talk about uh the boston metro system though uh so you 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 um you know you started advising the team on their physical readiness and preparing them for competition. Mm -hmm. How did you go about analyzing the things that they were expected to do uh, during a competition? And then how did you tailor training to that? Right, so the first thing I do when I'm creating a program for anybody um, is look at what it is that they need the program for. Uh, so generally with the Marines, it's basic strength, right? They need to be stronger and they need to be faster. But with the teams, there were a lot of really specific parameters that I had to work in and I had to really learn about what they do and I'm still learning about what they do. Um, so like I had to learn what their stages 
look like? Like, obviously, they're always different, but are they really spread out? How short are they? How long are they? What are the physical demands that they find themselves in when they're competing? Um, so I asked a ton of questions. Like before, I'm always asking questions. Um, what specific movement patterns are you doing? Are you moving up and down a lot? Um, how how far laterally are you moving? So once I kind of get like a, a mindset of that, then I can go and I can ask them questions about what do you think you need help with? Now that I've seen your stages and stuff, now that you've told me what you do, what is it that you need? And I watch them, you know, so then I start watching a lot of videos, um, specifically the athletes, like the guys on the team, specifically them, because I can watch videos of other people. But if I'm going to be programming for a select group of guys, then I need to see them move um, so that I can familiarize myself with, OK, well, he says his hips might hurt. So what do I need to do to help him better with his movement when he's got really short stages? Or what do I need to do to help him with his acceleration because he's having trouble getting out of this really tight corner and accelerating and he's, his stages are longer. Um, and then I kind of have to figure out how to put it all together. And that's okay. the hardest part, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially with so many different, like some of the guys are, they have athletic backgrounds and you can tell yeah. by the way they move. And yeah. some Marines, I'm sure, I'm sure you work with a lot of them are hilariously yeah. uncoordinated with their feet and they're more just, you know, they're, they can pick things up and put them down, but they can't, the, the balance in the footwork isn't necessarily there. I meant to ask, uh, what sports did you predominantly work with in your time at, uh, in New Hampshire? So, um, at UNH, I worked with, uh, the football team. I worked with men's ice hockey, alpine skiing. So it's downhill skiing, um, track and field and soccer. And then when I was at Boston University, my main focus was the men's crew team. So I worked with like the 60 of them, almost 70 of them by myself. And then I assisted with some other teams here and there. Okay. So yeah, yeah. quite a diversity in sports that you worked with. Um, yeah. Yeah. Out, out of the ones that you have worked with, which one was like closest to what you've been doing for the team? <laughs> um, whew. I think in terms of me having to learn some things it would be it would be crew it would be the men's men's rowing at bu because i didn't know anything about rowing before i started working with them and they are a pretty gangly awkward group of guys and i find that a lot of marines tend to be pretty gangly and awkward <laughs> and not really know <laughs> how to move well um but in terms of like change of direction and stuff i guess probably like hockey and football were actually more similar than you'd imagine because there's so much cutting and change of direction. So a lot of hip stuff, a lot of knee drive stuff, a lot of posterior chain. Like, I mean, the guys on the team, both action and pistol, which is who I work with. Um, they both need that a lot. All yeah. right. I, I, I got to just add something and you talk hockey. Uh, <laughs> who is your team? Your ice hockey? Yeah. I'm a Bruins fan, obviously. Uh, I, I figured you were going to say that. <laughs> Last time Bruins were any good was back in like 2012, whenever they had uh, Tim I can't, Tim Talbot. I can't remember his last name. Uh, They're but... doing pretty dang well this year, though. Are they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are. <laughs> the Patriots but... are really the team that are doing oh terrible. Oh, my God. I, I went um, to the... go see them last Thursday, and thankfully oh. they pulled off the win. But when I bought that ticket, I was in such a different frame of mind. I went into the season with so much hope. But the good thing about being a Boston sports fan is that at any given moment, one of those teams is going off. It's so rare that all four of the professional sports teams are in a, in a pit of despair like the Patriots are right now. Oh, I've, I've, yeah, I've, you, you learn to deal with heartbreak as a New England sports fan, though. I view like Boston sports teams like in the fans almost as if I view like English soccer fans football fans like if we're they don't intense. do well like they're pissed off they're getting ready to fight and brawls break out and it's like yeah. you have to leave the stadium minutes before they release so you can miss yeah. all the fights yes i've been in plenty of crowds with like riot police and stuff like that just because i was there both times the red sox won the world series mm. i mean it's i've never experienced anything like it it's 
So in uh, some of the analysis that you've done for the styles of competition that both the um, the three gun guys and also the pistol team compete in, mm -hmm. how how'd you go about breaking down some of the movements and exercises that would benefit them the most? And what would you say has yielded like the highest, I guess, rate of success in terms of what you worked with, uh, worked, worked with them on? So... A lot of things are the same. A lot of the stuff that I write for the guy for the guys is the same. Um, their acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, those are all important for both of them. But I think the biggest difference is their length of stages and the size, like the layout of the stages. And so when I write their programs, um, the biggest difference that I find is pistol tends to have, or what I've been programming is that they'll tend to have more um, hip mobility and like quick change of direction stuff and like single leg knee dominant stuff. Whereas for um, three gun, I would have them do a lot more knee drive and hip drive work because their stages being spread out more lets them almost be a little, they don't have to be as quick out of the pocket in their change but they need to be stronger longer. So I do more sled drive dominant, like mm -hmm. knee dominant stuff. Um, whereas with pistol, they need to be able to change really quickly and like get out of that bottom position really quickly, I think. So the biggest difference in my programming is really their conditioning that I give them and then some of their accessory stuff. If you looked at them, I should have like attached some or something or sent some to you ahead of time, but um, like their plyos are the same their explosive work, like ladders, cone drills, a lot of that stuff is the same. And then their accessory blocks at the end and their conditioning is different. Because obviously if their stages are different lengths, then I can't really make their conditioning the same. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, completely makes sense. We've talked a lot. I think we've talked a lot about movement, but something I'm mm -hmm. kind of interested in, you've talked a little bit about flexibility. Have you worked with them specifically on like the hip flexibility and like detaching the upper and lower body? in order to be able to shoot on the move, like say, for example, moving in one direction and completely facing the other direction? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm supposed to, quote unquote, supposed to see them twice a week. Like that's what I have programmed for them. So one of the days has cone drills and one of the days has ladder drills. And really the focus of that stuff was to work on differentiation between their upper and lower body. Um, so, in a ladder drill, like their feet are doing one thing, but their upper body is doing something different, right? And then pretty much everything that I do has some sort of hip mobility, shoulder mobility, grip work is really, I do a ton of grip strength work with them um, because they do need the, the mobility and the flexibility. And so I always have that stuff tied in. Yeah, uh, and you just made me think of something else. So with competition shooting, there's a lot of repetition. Do you mm -hmm. talk to them about how to reduce overwork injuries or overuse? Um, I never, I haven't really. Uh, I mean, I could get into like, well, listen, I don't travel with them. When I was in the college setting, I traveled with my guys. So if we were going to a race then, and we were all in a hotel, I was like, all right, we've got mobility stuff in the morning. See you at 7 a.m. Like we're going to go through all the boring shit. But like, I can't do that. I'm not with these guys. So I can send them a list of like mobility warm up stuff to do and say, hey, you really should do this before you compete. Um, and if you have a long time between stages, do it again. But I can't really make them do that. And so I feel like I can't really speak to the overuse thing, right? Like I can tell you, you really should, you know, give yourself a rest, but I can't make them do that. You know, I really only have two hours a week with them. And that's if I see them twice a week, which yeah. when they're in the middle of competing, mm -hmm. sometimes I'll only see them once. And that one time I'll have to modify everything dramatically because I don't want them to be super sore or something for their, for their match. I gotcha. have, a I, I have a quick question based on that as, as I am aging and uh, getting on in years, uh, how important would you say it is and how often should I do mobility type stuff like that? And, and the flexibility stuff, um, throughout time in competition or in preparation. 
I mean, I don't think you can really do it too much. Um, I would say if you have, if you're, if you're not competing, if you're in a season where you're not competing, um, you know, every other day spending some quality time actually doing some stuff like 35, 40 minutes, something like that. But if you're competing, I would say every day, just doing like 10 to 15 minutes worth of stuff. Um, and it's hard because I know it gets really repetitive for the guys. Like, if I give them one list of movements and it's like seven to 10 movements, they're going to get tired of doing those every day. I get that. I myself have a whole plethora of movements in my head that I can pull from. So they're not necessarily going to want to do them over and over again. I'm trying to give them as much as like I can so that they have more to kind of pull from themselves so they don't get tired of it. But I would honestly say like every day, like, it's not going to hurt you to do it every day. And mo mobility stuff is more important than the flexibility. Like it comes, you, you kind of gain that flexibility with the mobility work that you're doing and your range of motion and stuff is more important than like whether you can touch your toes. Right. Yeah. Now, now uh, one other thing I wanted to ask, uh, I remember whenever we first started this years ago, um, breathing exercises with the, the mobility, was a huge mm -hmm. thing are you yep. still really focusing oh, yeah. on that breathing oh yeah um it is probably one of the most important things that you can do before a workout if i don't do my own if i don't do a full warm-up i'm gonna do some diaphragmatic breathing because not only like mentally does it give you that uh that intention and kind of that focus that you need that clarity that you need but it helps you create tension in places you want it. So anytime we work out, we have an external load, right? We pick up a dumbbell, we pick up a kettlebell, we pick up a barbell. That's an external load and we need to be able to create tension. And if we aren't able to do that on command, right? Then we're gonna have more likelihood of getting hurt. More injuries could occur. So when we do our diaphragmatic breathing, whether it's 90-90, whether it's crocodile breathing, whatever, um, those are the two I'm, I use mostly. Then that focus is where can I create tension? I'm telling the guys, okay, you should feel tension in the floor. You should feel tension in your hands. You should feel your hands move apart because I want their mind to be able to learn it intentionally, do it intentionally there so that they don't necessarily have to think about it as intentionally when they're doing the movement. But obviously it's still important too. You know, I do it all the time. They'll, they'll say that it's like my biggest thing. I'm always telling them to breathe. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I mean, it's good because I know for a fact that some of them aren't breathing as they're running around stages. Like they'll, oh yeah. yeah and, hold and their breath. Not, which, which there isn't necessarily anything wrong with if they know kind of their breakdown steps and where they need to hold and where they need to breathe. Cause it is a, a your heart rate is a huge deal when you're trying to pick up a target mm -hmm. and still your body to be accurate, right? So I'm not going to be like, oh, don't hold your breath. Like it's more about the creating tension through your body and being able to draw that focus where it needs to go. Yeah, completely makes sense. Uh, last question for me, and you mentioned this, uh, the team travels a lot. They go all over the country. Um, and then you traveled a lot with your athletes back when you were working in Boston, New Hampshire. Uh, do you have specific protocols for people who might be in a plane for a long time and in a car for a long time, and then they got to get out of that, get to their hotel and then be ready to compete the next day? Uh, is there something that you tell the team guys in order to like get ready for activity shortly after being cooped up for so long? Um, generally, like I've given them a list before I've sent them like, Hey, um, do these seven things, you know, before, you know, before you go to bed or do these seven things before you're whatever, but it's more so, Hey, what's hurting? Like if X, Y, and Z things are hurting, then I'll try and remember what I've used in their warmups that they might remember. There's been a few times I've sent them videos. Cause I'm like, Oh, you know, it'd be really good for you. Is this one that I've never done? Let me take a video and I'll send it to you. Um, and so hopefully they, will use that. But a lot of times I'm having to reach out to them. So they're not like, Hey, Kelsey, I'm really sore. Give me something to do. You know what I mean? Like, or I sat on a plane or, you know, I sat in a car for 12 hours. It's me being like, Hey, how are you feeling? Have you checked into your hotel yet? Like, 
it's me being proactive about finding out if they need something. That makes sense. Uh, that's how Marines <laughs> are. If if those guys are hurt, the the last thing we're going to do is yeah. bug someone else about it. Uh, they might complain about it to each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's great. That's great that you're doing that for them because they're definitely not doing it for themselves. It's true. Any, it's true. Shoot, I, I I'm going to start texting you. Hey, can you can you remind me some of this stuff? Oh, all right. Don't don't accept text from Matt. It will just be like every hour. He's like, it all hurts. It all hurts. <laughs> Everything just... hurts. I'll put you to the test. I'll make sure you remember things. It's okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> um. So nutrition. I used to be really big on nutrition, but I think there was maybe one time in my life where I was like really good at holding on to a diet. And I, I think it was really important at the time just because I was an SOI instructor and we are expending a ton of calories there. But in in terms of nutrition um, with what we're doing in competition, uh, do you advise any of the guys on best practices for optimal performance? And then what are the do's and don'ts of nutrition? Uh, so um, I, first of all, I'm not a registered dietitian or a registered nutritionist. So I cannot give really any strict specific dietary plans to them. Like they can't come to me and say, I want to eat better. Like how many calories and break down how much I should have of my food. I can't do that. Like legally. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, and let's be honest, like the Marine, they're Marines. They don't want to talk about nutrition because what am I going to tell them? Eat more whole foods, eat more protein, eat less junk food, uh, drink more water, drink less alcohol don't smoke, sleep more. Like they know these things. None of them are sexy or cool. They don't need me to be a broken record and like tell them that. I mean, I can. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes I'll be like, did any of you guys, none of you guys ate today? Like, are you kidding me? Like, come on, you guys. Um, But I'm not their mom, so I can't do anything about it. Like I I can tell them to do all those things, but they're not really coming to me with that. Like, Marines don't want to talk about nutrition. Um, so if they do say something, if they ask me a question, then I will answer it. But uh, I, I'm pretty vague, honestly. They they don't want that. Yeah. They don't want me to tell them to to not use tobacco and to sleep more, drink less energy drinks. Which is kind of funny, considering nutrition <laughs> is probably one of the most important aspects of like staying fit and staying healthy true you know if i saw them more um if i saw them more than once or twice a week it would probably be an easier conversation to have or or not easier it's not like it's a hard conversation it would be a more worthwhile conversation to have right because i could say hey your nutritional dietary habits are affecting all of this training we're doing in the gym Right. Mm-hmm. But because I only see them once or twice a week. You don't well, get I that. Can't really say. Yeah. Yes. Is it? Sure. But like, to what extent? I don't really know. Mm-hmm. You know, none of them are out of shape. I can't say all oh, you guys are all overweight. You know what I mean? They're not. Right. So I kind of leave it. I kind of leave it up to them. I may give them shit from time to time for something that they're eating or for their energy drinks because I hate energy drinks. But um <laughs> I I drink copious amounts of caffeine, but I hate energy drinks. So I at my worst, I was I don't drink energy drinks anymore. Like I'm completely off of them. Uh, And a lot of it came down to I'm off of I'm off of the drugs. Well, I I drank when I was when I was an SOI instructor, I was drinking up to 12 energy drinks a day. Shut up. Dead serious. Yeah. Uh, that and is disgusting. You, can't tell her, you can't tell her things like that, dude. Don't, well, don't tell her about it. Is. What, well, don't you put know, numbers there. And, and quite honestly, what got me off of it is like. Heart palpitations? Were you passing out? I, I did not get I that, but a friend of mine did. Um, and he ended up having to get a heart transplant and he ended up That's dying. Intense. He got, he died a year later. Um, oh, God. So. That was a lesson learned. I, I would mean, say so. Yeah. Uh, kind kind of moving on 
from the darkness. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, supplements. Um, I tend to stick to just protein powder, multivitamin, um, stuff like that. Um, would you say that's a good approach or are there, are there any benefits to taking any other type of supplements out there? Okay. <clears throat> Again, I'm not a dietitian, right? Right. Um, I think that supplements are really specific, right? To the person, like vitamins, minerals, taking stuff like that. It's very specific to the person. Um, but I can, I can give you like my personal thoughts, right? So I think if there's anything that people should be taking, it's vitamin D and magnesium. Um, and I've talked to some of the guys about this before, but pretty much everyone's deficient in vitamin D, especially during this time of the year, but also year round. Um, and specifically like a vitamin D and K2 supplement because they help each other with absorption. Magnesium, if you don't know anything about it, basically affects everything that happens in your body. Like everything, all the hormonal processes that take place in your body are affected by magnesium. So those are like the two that I think are the most important, like over a multivitamin, because in reality, like I don't love multivitamins. I don't take one. Um, if you've ever looked at the nutritional like facts on them, you've got like 2000, you know, percent of your daily value of like all of the vitamins, right? Do you know why they do that? Hmm. They do it because you're going to like get rid of half of it. Like you're not even going to absorb 75%. That's don't quote me on that number. You're not going to absorb most of that into your body. Right. right. Because a lot of the vitamins and minerals interact with each other in a negative way. And so they inhibit absorption. So I never really take a multivitamin. Um, I take vitamin D and K2. It's like a, liquid drop, um, magnesium and iron. And again, those are specific to me, but pretty much everyone can benefit from vitamin D and from magnesium. Um, in terms of like protein powder and collagen and like creatine and stuff like that, they're all really great. Um, most people could probably benefit from them. Not everyone necessarily needs them all. Probably collagen would be the most important because it's got more like long-term total body effects. And I would tell people that they should be getting their protein from food, not the powder if they can. Right. And if they're not working out every single day, they probably don't need creatine, even though, you know, everyone loves to take it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's very specific to people, but magnesium, vitamin D, K2, collagen, and I don't take, I don't take collagen or creatine or use protein powder. Like I should, I'm not perfect. Your coach is not perfect. <laughs> I probably need to incorporate creatine and collagen into my daily supplement intake. Um, but yeah. No, no, that's, that's interesting. I would have never thought of some of those things. And I think I'm going to actually kind of look into some of them, uh, so Just if you to... look into magnesium, there's a million different kinds. Um, and by a million, I mean, there might be like 12 different variations of magnesium and it's the, how the magnesium is like made essentially. Um, and they all will help with different things. So like, if you want help with sleep or you want help with anxiety or you want help with whatever, um, there's different forms of magnesium that will affect those things more. Well, I need one for sleep. Okay. Well, I can give you, <laughs> I can tell you the ones that I'll, I'll let you know what I take. I'll have to go look at all the, you know, the bottles and whatnot, but um, yeah. yeah, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll hit you up tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so it seems like the team's kind of rubbed off on you some, like, you know, <laughs> It, you don't have a competitive shooting background. Now you're surrounded by a bunch of dudes who do nothing but compete. And now you're actually starting to look for a firearm and, and looking to get into the shooting sports. Now, um, you know, have you, have you kind of figured out what discipline that you see yourself participating, participating in it? And if you do get started, what are your kind of short, mid and long-term goals for once you start? Oh man. Um, yes, they're rubbing off. So I did grow up shooting. 
Um, but it was always recreationally, right? Like yeah. learned on a little 22 and then I, you know, went and, you know, my dad had a bunch of shotguns and, uh, we didn't learn how to shoot handguns until later. And actually we went to the SIG Academy in New Hampshire and took like firearm courses, like as a family, like here's our family outing guys. We're going to go to the SIG Academy and take these. Two. Yeah. Um, so I have been around plenty of firearms, but I had no idea what competitive shooting was until like you guys walked in, however met me out two and a half or three years ago, whenever that was, right? Um, I'm really trying to keep myself reined in because I don't do things like halfway very well. Um, but I also have to, I've struggled with getting out of the coach mindset and like the leader mindset. I I haven't been a student um, in a very long time. So being the person that is like, I have to step out of my normal mindset of being the subject matter expert and like being the one that people are coming to. And then like, let myself actually realize that I'm probably going to be really shitty and I'm going to fail a whole lot. And like, no one wants to do that. So, um, that's been like a bit hard to adjust to, I think, but the guys have been really great. Um, in terms of like helping me and answering questions and whatnot. But that being said, I don't own a shotgun or a rifle right now. So I definitely don't think I'd be in like the two or three gun world for a while. I think that would be badass, but um, probably have to start in pistol because that's what I have. So, and goals, I'm trying not to make goals. I'm trying to let myself just enjoy things. And not put a lot of pressure on myself because I will put pressure on myself and then I'm not going to want to do it anymore. And I'm going to get mad. I don't, I don't need that. No, that's not a bad outlook to have. Like most people, like I just tell them, Hey, your first few times that first year, just go out there and learn from everybody else and have fun. Don't put that pressure on you because then you're just not going to enjoy it. And then why are you doing it? Um, But I always put pressure on me. So. Oh yeah. Well, we're, we're, we are our own worst critics. We are. Yes. But also, I mean, like I'm a pretty type A person, like I'm an Enneagram eight, right? Like it, it means that I just have to be the one that's in charge of everything and controlling everything. And, um, so to, to let that kind of go and be like, okay, these people that I'm coaching are now going to be like my coach. It's like hard to switch that on and off. Well, you know what? We have the perfect position for you on the squad. <laughs> We're going to put you as a squad mom. Oh, God. Make, make you, you can make sure everybody's where they need to be when they need to be and be like, <laughs> hey, Haswell, be here now. Yeah. Yep. You're up. Go. Oh, hey, Jesus. Listen, my daughter is six going on 16. I can't handle more kids. <laughs> <laughs> I can't handle type A Marines. <laughs> okay. Oh, bullshit. Well, I do. Technically, I guess I do all the time. I think you'll do Maybe just not. fine. Having shot with them at competitions, and they're going to be listening to this, but uh, they could probably they could probably use an assertive presence to tell them when they're overthinking something or they're doing something unproductive. Uh, yeah. They could I mean, I do use. love that part of, I do love that part of coaching, honestly. Um my master's degrees in coaching, like physical education and coaching, but it really was two years of psychology, like learning how athletes work and learning about like getting buy-in, connecting with them. Like I joke, but it's not really a joke. Like I am really invested in the guys. So it's not just, I'll see you in the gym and that's it. You know, like, sure. I might not give them, a whole ton of nutritionary guidance and tell them, you know, like, don't go smoke. Like I might not necessarily do that, but I check in with them regularly because you spend so much time programming, learning, but they're more than just the person that I see in the gym. And like, they need to understand that I know that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because how are they going to trust me and let me do what I need to do to make them better? If they think that I'm just, you know, yelling at him in the gym right yep so i love that part of my job one of the most important things i think i could have ever heard before uh, after like having a shitty stage finish is hey man 
you have five minutes to get over yourself and be pissed off. And then you got to move on and yeah. prep for the next stage. And yeah. it's like, that's probably like and one like, of the best things you could could hear. Yeah. Because you have to accept what just happened, but you have to go perform again. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I mean, that really translates to any athlete, you know, um, helping them in the college setting. It's like, wow, they're more than just an athlete. They're, a student they have lives right if that matters to them imagine how much more it matters to these guys these are you know marines they're like adults they have lives outside of what they do with me and i have to be able to connect with them in such a way that i can help them in the gym but i can help them like you said like after that stage what what do you need okay like that that fucking sucked cool let's go regroup and figure it out and do it better And then at the end of the match, you, you know, you could sulk all you like, drink all you you like. No, don't, don't get drunk. (laughs) Now you, you don't ever want to get drunk in a, in an upset mood, but no, I mean, it's just, you can release it however you like once everything's all over, but you have to still be able to maintain that, that focused mentality. Yeah, you do. You do. But they have to realize too, that. Like earlier, I talked about how I have to modify everything so much for them, right? Like I'm supposed to see them twice a week, but I might only see them once a week. And I'm trying to mitigate soreness. I'm trying to mitigate injuries. But the soreness and injuries aren't just going to come from their matches because the stress in their lives comes from everywhere, not just their work, not just competing, not just whether they did bad or they did well. Um, so I have to be able to recognize, is this stress like a mental stress? Did they do really shitty and they're just in a bad mood and they're angry? Like, how do I need to change their program? What do I need to, do I need to take off load? Do I need to take some sets and some reps out because they can't focus well enough right now to do anything crazy technical? Like, where can I modify things? Because body doesn't know the difference in the stressors and I have to help them help themselves without them necessarily always wanting me to. Yeah. Yeah. So for those that are currently in the shooting sports and they want to improve not only their performance, but their lifestyle, what kind of advice would you have for them in starting a fitness regimen? Uh, so any, I would tell anybody, um, that starting anything new is going to take consistency and planning and a realistic idea of what you can do. Right. I think that's one of the biggest things is that people think they can do. It's, it's a fine line between thinking you can do more than you can and thinking you can do way too much. Right. Um, And so people just jump out of the gate doing all this stuff and they can't stay consistent with it. They can't keep up with it or they get hurt too quickly. So I think being really realistic with what you can start with. If that's twice a week, that's better than if you weren't doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. And once you can commit to twice a week, and that's just an example, obviously, but once you can commit to twice a week for an extended period of time, then you can add something else to that, right? But you need to be realistic. And most of us are not realistic with ourselves. So that's one thing, but I mean... I think as Let's you see. get older, you, 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 some people, not all, some people learn to be, be able to set more realistic goals uh, yeah. and, and actually listen to their body. And then some people just fail completely at it. Listening to your body is very important. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would tell anybody, especially younger Marines, younger people in general, like stay away from social media influencers, the fitness Influent, like, don't, if it looks badass or it looks sexy, you don't need to be doing it. Okay. Like, just don't. (laughs) Less is probably more. Mm -hmm. Like, work smarter, not harder. You don't need to be killing yourself every day, everywhere, workout. Right. Um, I mean, again, consistency, do your breath work, always breathe, always do breathing. I would tell people that. What else do Marines need to know? Um, 
your strength is more important than your bulk. Like you strength is way more important than how big you are. When I program for almost anybody, it is not to make them swole. I could, I could care less. You need to be explosive. You need to be able to accelerate, decelerate, be strong. That's way more important than how big you are. I have one to add to that. Um, yeah. If you hadn't haven't been doing something for a while, let's say you just came back from a deployment or you just, ha you know, haven't been doing it. Don't think you can go back to the old yes. weight or the old volume like you used to before yes. and just start right there. Yes. Again, that goes back to being realistic, though. Like mm -hmm. and I I'm I'm not perfect. Like I won't have deadlifted to 25 or 275 for a year and i'll be like oh i can totally i can totally do that and like i probably couldn't right now if i tried like i haven't done it in forever i probably shouldn't go tomorrow to work and try without doing some other things first and like working up to it so i remember again whenever, be realistic i remember whenever we went to um whenever we were doing all the strength and conditioning tests that you guys were putting us through yep. and like i i been doing some workouts but i hadn't been consistent with it and so here we are we're doing deadlifts and squats and you know me and kyle are kind of in a race to see who's the strongest at this point and so i think i threw 345 on the bar for the squat and i got it but i was just like that was dumb it really wasn't pretty yeah no so i did assessment stuff with the guys when i first started seeing them i did pro agility like a 5105 Yep. I did um, three rep max deadlift, three rep max bench, three rep max squat. I did something else. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I have. I obviously have it all, all on my computer, but I never used any of it. And a couple of them would ask me like, hey, are we going to get like percentages to like know how much to lift? And I was like, not right now. Like I literally used the assessments to gauge kind of like how they worked and how they pushed themselves. Mm -hmm. Like because of when I started with them, it was kind of in the middle of their season. Yep. Um, so I wasn't going to be like, oh, you need to be lifting 80% of your three rep max right now when they, I might only see them once a week and I might not see them at all for a week. Like I can't give those strict parameters because again, that goes back to like mitigating injury and soreness, right? They're not going to do well on a match if I make them super fucking sore. Mm -hmm. um, so all the assessments that I took, I have all their numbers and I'm going to do it with them again. But it was really so that I could see one, how they move and two, how they push themselves. Because some of them you could tell like could have gone heavier, didn't really. But I really just wanted to like observe mm -hmm. and I used it. So I used the assessments in a pretty untraditional way. No, that's a good way to, I, I, I like that approach. You can kind of see where, where people's hearts are. Yeah. Yeah. But Kelsey, um, I want to kind of give you the floor now. Uh, if you have anything that you would like to add. Anything to add guys, um, come back to the hit center. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the, Honestly, like working with the guys has been really cool. Um, I love being able to take something that I am really passionate about and combining it with something that is a little bit out of the norm, right? Like strength coaches, you think sports, right? People aren't thinking competitive shooting, but there's a whole untapped world, I think, of um, kind of that relationship of strength coach competitive shooting and we see it with some things you know like the patriot games and some of the other like bigger things that combine crossfit but a lot of that is people working out on their own it's not necessarily like a structured program that has any longevity so really what i want what i want out of this is to be able to take the team long term and see what changes we can make. Cause when I was with, when I was working with you guys, it was strong for a while. And then it kind of like fizzled out. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, obviously the holidays Marine Corps, everyone's gone on leave and whatnot. I know nothing's going to happen right now. We were so strong for a while, but it was in season and you can't grow in season. You can't get stronger in season in season. 
is for maintenance. Yep. In season is for surviving. Sustainment. Sustainment. It's yeah, sustaining. You're trying to survive. You're trying not to get hurt. Um, it's all about mitigation, which is true in the collegiate world as well with regular sports. But I want to see what we can do in a quote unquote off season. Like, what can we do if these guys are consistent and coming regularly and like committed? Because you can be consistent and not be committed. Like, you could give two shits if you're there twice a week and you're just kind of like going through the motions and I won't be able to really help you if you are. But what I really want is to see what we can do in an off season and how we can make the next in season even better. I like. I that. want that longevity, right? Cause my background again in collegiate athletics, we have that longevity. We have a whole year's worth of training that we're working towards one thing. And with my job at Quantico, you don't really get that at all. The Marines are just coming into the hit center randomly. People are working out randomly. You don't get that kind of long-term planning that has that success and that kind of finale, right? This, the team could be that. Yeah. And that's really cool to be a part of something like that again, if we can get them consistent and committed to it. That's what I want. I like that. No, that's, that's really good. I like that. But I just wanted to say thank you. I really appreciate you coming on here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. But uh, <laughs> for all our listeners, we really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we hope you got something out of this. And if you could let us know how we're doing, uh, give us a review, rate us, hit us up if you have any questions. Um, if you have any questions for Kelsey, let us know. We'll get them to her and we'll try and get you an answer back. But other than that, we hope you have a good one.